Welcome to the History Hotline, a direct line to a better understanding of all things Black History and beyond. Welcome to another episode of the History Hotline. My name is Deanna Lincook and as always I'll be your host today. And you'll see from today's episode title that I am joined by a very special guest and I feel like one of the really cool things about doing a podcast um, and doing a PhD I guess but I guess the podcast gives me uh, visibility shall we say is that you kind of are able to connect with other people doing similar work to you, working on similar time periods, similar regions, especially when there are so few scholars, PhD students working on the Caribbean, also Black Britain, but for the context of today's podcast, the Caribbean. Um, so it's really cool to be able to connect with scholars all around the world, actually, um, through this work. So I find that a quite a cool thing about podcasting, especially. Um, and I'm joined here today by Alexandria Miller, who is the founder of Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture, the podcast, and also works on the region as a PhD student as well. Um, it's just such an honour to have her here. I did an episode um, where I was invited on to Strictly Facts podcast, and it was such an honour and a privilege to talk about my research and to a new audience as well um, and I really wanted to get Alexandria back here so that we could kind of continue the conversation selfishly because we were having a good chat if you haven't listened to that episode already then you definitely should um, you can check her out on all good podcast platforms that is Strictly Facts Podcast a guide to Caribbean history and culture but before you do that you can stick around here uh, and listen to what we have to say all about uh, Alexandria's research the podcast and the work that she's doing thank you so much Dan it's so much of a pleasure to be in the History Hotline and really grateful that we've had this opportunity to cross over on each other's shows and, you know, expose others to who are interested in Caribbean history on other sides of the ocean. So really happy to be here. But before I continue, let me introduce you to our listeners. Alexandria is a historian, writer and multimedia documentarian who has a passion for capturing Caribbean stories. She's currently a PhD candidate um, in the Department of Africana Studies at Brown University in the US. Um, and she was selected as one of the 30 under 30 Caribbean American emerging leaders by the Institute of Caribbean Studies in 2018. Um, and as a member of the beautiful project, her photography, a multifaceted woman, we love to see it, um, on Black Women's Beauty was showcased at the Metropolitan Museum of Art the following year. Um, I feel like that bio doesn't really do you justice, to be honest. There are so many other things that we could talk about that you do. Um, her podcast, Strictly uh, Facts, that I've spoken about already, your academic work, your work with, within heritage and cultural spaces and museums as well. Um, it is honestly such a pleasure to have you. But I thought for all my audience to get to know you a little bit better, we have a little tradition around here where we have some quick fire questions. Although I've realised the answers are never quick fire, like people really <laughs> want to explain. So I will give you room and space to explain. Okay. Um, but sure. I will start with uh, what is your favourite historical time period? I don't know if it is. I when when I was thinking about this, I was like, I mean, I'm a 20th century girl at heart. Like I don't. Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, it wasn't that long ago in a right. lot of instances, right? And yet there's still so much we don't know or, you know, hasn't been fully explored about it. I think on one hand, if you take, you know, Caribbean history um, and Caribbean independence movements at that, right, we'll always say, you know, Jamaica independence, 1962 and Ray and all of these mm -hmm. things. But you know, it there was a process before that, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many levels of things that happen in the 20th century. And to be able to, you know, talk to my grandparents who were alive well before independence, right? And be able yeah. to learn from their experiences what Jamaica was like before independence and post-independence and all of these things. So I'm a major fan of 20th century just for all that I think 
is still to be explored. Absolutely. I would agree. Definitely. Maybe I'm biased as well. But I just also like that we have like, I like the source base. You've got people. Yeah. We can do oral history. We have photographs. We have videos sometimes. Um, I have friends that study like medieval history and they have none of that. And they have manuscripts, which is... I guess cool in its own way but it's not it's not 20th century (laughs) you just have to work with whatever those archives are but you know we very much so have living archives a lot of the time for 20th century stuff so absolutely exactly um and then I guess within that maybe within the 20th century do you have a favorite historical figure this will be an interesting one when you when I thought of this question I was like you know Claudia Jones I think is one of my favorites who I think especially from the more UK-based perspective might be a lot more well known than maybe in the US but I think for those who have read books about Claudia Jones are a little bit familiar with her story um born in Trinidad but migrates to the US actually at a very young age and is very tremendously impactful with like the US Communist Party um advocating for black women's rights and sort of like a intersectional approach to um activism and things at the time before even um later migrating to the UK and so I think she's one that while you all might your audience might be more familiar about has definitely had a very understudied and underanalyzed impact around not even just the US but global politics she gave you know speeches around the world and things like absolutely I was going to ask you actually um because I think in the UK she comes to the UK at a point where we're starting to see some of the post-war migration um, and so she is kind of spoken about in that context, whereas in the US, she obviously arrives um, quite younger and then she's deported and her activity center around mm-hmm. uh, the Communist Party. I've always wondered because I learned first about Claudia Jones in a US history module at university, not in anything to do with Black Britain or the Caribbean. So I wondered how that it's taught there. Not, not, not oh. well. OK, I'll say. I'll say prior to college, right, learned yeah. nothing of, of about Claudia Jones. She's not in any of the major, you know, high school history books or anything to that nature, yeah. at least when I was in school or, you know, where I went to school. Um, I learned about her in college and, you know, grad school and things to that nature more so. Um, and I guess at that point, you know, there have been quite a few texts about her um, really shepherded by Carol Boyce Davies doing a lot of that work from our perspective on, you know, in the U S. Um, but even still, you know, I think there is a lot more to be written about, especially her work in the U S that isn't, um, very well known, but it's interesting Mm -hmm. for, you know, to, for us to compare our perspectives because, you know, it kind of shows up at the tail end of, I guess, what I learned in terms of, you know, what she goes on to do in, in the UK in terms of, um, car- you know, Carnival and yeah. the newspaper she founded, et cetera. But that's kind of like yeah. all we get. It's sort of like a one liner there, you know, gets yeah. deported from the U.S. and yep. then founds these things in the U.K. But that's where the line gets drawn. Wow, that's so interesting. And I just I always love like figuring out how people are received in different places mm-hmm. around the world. Um, And yeah, when people have such, I guess, multifaceted lives and end up living and actually wherever Claudia Jones lives, she really does make a statement. She's not just there to be there. Right. So it's interesting how kind of that's that's like taught or not, um, as you mentioned. Um, Do you think there is or do you have, sorry, a historical figure? that you think more people need to know about, wish more people knew about? She's definitely one, but I think there, for me, it's looking at a lot of those like 20th century women that are impactful. You know, I think when we think of movements of the 21st century, like um, Garvey's UNIA, right? We're quick to always mention Garvey, but not the countless other women who were part of that. And I think that's tremendous for me. So whether it's Amy Jacks Garvey, Amy Ashwood Garvey, um, I, you know, the list could definitely go on. I think there's a lot of work that we could talk about in terms of movements for, you know, different women's movements in the Caribbean. Um, yeah. But just hoping people do like a more intersectional sort of understanding of different movements, because while, you know, there are definitely hierarchies of how things have evolved right they are experienced by different people 
different ways mm-hmm. based off race, based off class, based off color, you know, all of those aspects. Yeah, definitely. I think in it feels like you're having to insert women into a narrative that yeah. always should have had women in it in the first place, um, especially with the early 20th century, for sure. Um, is Do you have then, following that historical event, you think more people should know about or you wish you could teach more people about? Hmm. I mean, I all of these are probably going to be sort of Caribbean focused as a fellow in the right place. Caribbean this person. Is where you right? Are for that. <laughs> right. Um, I've met so many people who don't know about the Haitian revolution. Mm. And that's always interesting to me, um, especially being born in the U S and Haiti is clearly not far away. Right. Um, but yeah. the fact that it comes as a surprise, you know, when people think of Haiti, they oftentimes think of the earthquake and, you know, yeah. all of the travesties that happened to Haiti, um, but not even understanding not only Haiti and its greatness for being the first Black Republic, right? But all of the systemic issues that have happened as a result, right? Having to pay back, quote unquote, yeah. reparations to France, you know, yeah. for their freedom and all of these things and really helping that to shape the sort of understanding of colonialism and anti-Blackness in this Atlantic world is one that I think could be taught a lot more. Um, And it's a complicated story too at that, right? So not even Mm -hmm. trying to just singularly focus and be like, yes, you know, whatever was done, but it went on for, you know, several years and then what happens as a result. So I've even tried on Strictly Facts to have quite a few episodes on the Haitian Revolution and its aftermath and a few things just to sort of help others get educated yeah. about that story but it's one that I think could definitely be taught better especially in a Caribbean history context definitely there's as you said there's so much to talk about when you think of the Haitian revolution you can come at it from so many perspectives in Britain I think we use um, CLR James as a black Jacobins quite a lot to mm-hmm. introduce that go, going through CLR James's work and, and opening up to Haiti but yeah there are just so many and the thing is with Haiti as well it's just it completely defines what's happening in this period of enslavement and transatlantic slave trade in the US, in the rest of the Caribbean, in the um, European colonies, not just Britain, which obviously looking at the Anglophone Caribbean, we tend to focus a lot on Britain, but pulling Mm -hmm. in France, pulling in all these other European colonizers into that picture um, in terms of the the battles that they had and who was supporting who and who was trying to um, aid who and whatever else. And and then that's not even getting into the like Toussaint Louverture, Dessalines, like you, right. there's just so much. Right. And then or the fact that a lot of other places, you know, places like Martinique, places like Guadeloupe, they were, you know, all looking to Haiti and not just French Caribbean, but across mm-hmm. the region, right? We're really yeah. looking to Haiti for motivation or people leaving, you know, fleeing from places like Martinique where slavery was still happening to yeah. move to like a Haiti where they're like, okay, I want my freedom and this is the place for it. So a lot, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert in in Haiti, in the Haitian revolution at all, but I think there's so much there that, you know, we can definitely understand in terms of our regional politics, Mm -hmm. how we've evolved as a people that even I think whether it's the diaspora or in the region, we can do a better job of not only uplifting that history, but, you know, using it to connect us all. Absolutely. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think the the fact that you said this is something that you think more people need to know about and the fact that it was also deliberately hidden from enslaved people on other islands has carried and that deliberate decision to make sure that people could not be inspired by Haiti, other enslaved people could not rise up in the same way, has carried through generations. So here we are still not not really knowing um what are you currently reading and I say that tentatively because you don't have to be reading anything you're doing a PhD I'm re I'm reading a lot of things precisely (laughs) Um, yes always as we are nearing these this trying to graduate um but I think one thing that has been of interest to me lately is Patricia Saunders Buyers Beware um and it's You know, she goes through different parts of Caribbean popular culture in the text, but 
looking through her analysis of sexuality, of gender, of race, of class, through these different things that um, sometimes we take for granted or, you know, we don't necessarily know the historical underpinnings of. That has been a cool book for me right now. Nice. I think that's, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, And if there were a text that has shaped the way you see the world um, and you would recommend to other people that are listening to this episode, what might that be? Easily Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. I think very, very solid choice for me. Very much one of the like early texts I read in college that helped to not only, I think, give a breath of life to colonization right um i don't i obviously don't know from the uk perspective how it's taught but you know very little is also taught about (laughs) africa um in the u.s right um and especially things that like very much so put the heat on these colonial powers like the u.s like your you know various european countries Um, And so this was one of the first ones for me that really put into context all of the things that like you kind of feel right. Um, Just when we're like looking at various systems, but that was one of the first for me that I was like, okay, now I'm, I'm starting to fully understand what's happened. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I have got that book on my shelf and I've, I've read it in sections. I've never read it in its entirety. And I feel like it, definitely needs to happen at some point um that and I've read groundings um with my mm-hmm. Roman sort of Rodney but not the whole of um how you've been developed I've had it for so long I should really should have um but and I think it's one it's helpful to like come back to things too right I think when I first read it right compared to a more recent reading you start to understand things differently so for sure um I wanted to spend a little bit of time essentially talking about your uh, academic journey um, and thinking about essentially why, why did you, Alexander Miller, Alexandria, sorry, um, come to, you know, doing a PhD, um, taking this academic study to the the peaks of academia. Um, And I guess to start with, why did you, I don't know, take up these kind of subjects and looking at these kinds of themes at your kind of undergrad, um, masters or, you know, that kind of level, um, where did it all begin? Yeah. Um, I did not necessarily start out thinking I was going to get a PhD. I thought I was going to law school. (laughs) I said that, um, (laughs) for many years as a kid and I was supposed to be a lawyer and do all these things. Um, but I got to college in, I started in 2013, um, for undergrad and, just very much so I mean I've always loved history right that's always been one of my favorite subjects and quickly um you know enrolled in undergrad and started taking classes in history and um at the time what my undergrad institution was calling African and African American studies so very similar to Africana it's just you know various departments here in the U.S. call it different things um but yeah started taking classes um primarily between those departments and really fell in love with being able to understand and see my history in a way that was not taught to me and probably being a little bit mad (laughs) that Mm -hmm. it took so long for me to understand certain things, right? A lot of what is taught about Black people, if it's taught at all in the U.S., um, is very minimalized, right? It's very trivialized. We get Mm -hmm. the standard you know Rosa Parks was tired and that's why she didn't (laughs) give off her seat off the bus right and that's not the truth of that at all right but it wasn't until I'm 18 in college in a classroom learning that Mm -hmm. that was a lie that I've been fed right for the last how many of her years of school and so um fell in love with really learning being able to learn and have these conversations and discussions um about Black history from a, you know, global context. Um, Also got the opportunity during my first year of undergrad to study, I was studying in a program that studied the U.S. civil rights movement and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. Got to travel to South Africa for a few weeks from that program. Um, And then was also in 
South Africa, like, yo, a lot of these places look like Jamaica, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, um, and again, a very different picture of whatever, you know, the commercials are about Africa and, yeah. you know, this imagery that we're getting, right, um, on TV or what have you. And so really falling in love with different ways of storytelling of and starting to see myself as possibly a historian it took a minute right it wasn't the easiest thing to get up and say yeah I'm not I don't think I'm gonna be a lawyer anymore it was quite a bit of time before I was finally comfortable with that decision um but really wanting to impact education in a way that you know hopefully students don't have to wait till they're 18 to learn these things or also understanding the structures of education right not everybody goes to college or not Mm -hmm. everybody has the means to go to college right um and so we should be thinking about education and cultural empowerment in varied ways right that allows for everybody to get this knowledge in a sense that isn't limited based off you know how far you go in school and whatever so I think ultimately it was my decision to, you know, go to a PhD was to really impact change in education, to empower people of color to understand themselves in various ways and do so from the standpoint of a person that looks like them, right? I wasn't till undergrad that like I started to have quite a few teachers of color, Mm -hmm. right? I think my best semester, the first semester of getting Dean's List at undergrad, I had all black women professors and I was probably 20 maybe. Right. Um, And so never that had never been my experience um, prior to that. And being able to have people who saw me in a particular light and, Mm -hmm. you know, didn't accost me for looking angry or whatever, Mm -hmm. all of the systemic things that you know we sometimes yeah. experience as people of color and so really just wanting to give back and shape that a little bit yeah definitely no that makes sense absolutely and it sounds like yeah I think your your undergrad your college experience kind of shaped a lot of your your thinking and your your work to this point um which is good because I think some people have the opposite unfortunately where their college experience turns them off education or it you know it doesn't um, uplift them in the way that they maybe assume or think that it, it will um so it, yeah it's a nice it's a nice positive um thing that's come out of that definitely um in sorry you said you kind of decided to do the PhD to kind of continue this um studying and to make sure you kind of were aware and understanding the systems in place but then how did you kind of I guess decide on a, a PhD topic in I will say in the UK you have to kind of decide on your PhD like before as in the subject of the thesis and you kind of put your proposal in based on what you're you're deciding and what you're planning to research and then you pick your like supervisors based on all that um is it similar in the U.S. and then how did you decide um what your kind of area of research would be or did that come later yeah so we kind of have that but it's not as stringent right you definitely like have to write in your application yeah um what you're hoping to study and you know, who you're hoping to work with or whatever when you're applying to graduate programs. Um, But you don't necessarily have to stick with that by any means once you get admitted. Um, I very much so, I guess this is sort of a, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I'm a Caribbean women's historian. So that was probably why I named like Claudia Jones and stuff earlier. (laughs) Um, But yeah, to, to the point that we were talking about earlier, there's not as many stories written about um, how Caribbean women have experienced these various movements or, you know, enacted change on the world. And so that was definitely what I came into thinking I was going to work about and still in a lot of ways is the core of my work, right? I think Mm -hmm. I've just been able to fine tune it more now. Um, And so my work now specifically looks at Caribbean women's labor, um, some of the like uncharted territories of work and the ways that Caribbean women have really contributed largely to um, political structures and things to that nature through popular culture, through work, through labor, um, in ways that don't 
necessarily always get highlighted. I think there are a lot of books or quite a few books looking at um, Caribbean women as like domestic workers yeah. um, or as, you know, through like informal work in various ways, which, you know, those texts are definitely impactful in my own research mm. but I think my work is hoping to you know approach it from a different perspective and look at some of the more global ways that um, particularly women in Jamaica have yeah. contributed to Jamaica's economy um, through their service um, through their coordination through their entrepreneurship brilliant absolutely that sounds wonderful um have you then had to conduct research in Jamaica like archival research and work like that and how has it been kind of traversing and, and doing your work across I guess two geographical space yeah for sure um so I have definitely done archival research but I think you know to the detriment in a lot of ways um how many like text and things are out there in various libraries specific yeah. to women um especially black women can be challenging and so I've more so relied on oral histories yeah, nice. um, and so thankfully I got a fellowship um, to be able to be in Jamaica for a bit of time doing some of these oral histories um, speaking with people one-on-one -on -one really and helping me to sort of write this story in a way that um, prides them you know puts their words to paper and hopefully one day um, you know creates a breadth of its own through various mediums I'd love to like do a documentary um yeah. as well from a lot of my oral histories brilliant um how has it been conducting oral histories um I know that I find it completely like it's like doing different history to do an archival work mm -hmm. especially I think for me I look at a lot of like colonial histories so I'm looking what I feel like anyway research in the Caribbean through the eyes of the people that colonized it as opposed to the people that um, are, are living there and, and actually identifying with being Caribbean. Um, yeah, how's it been kind of the difference or, or taking on these stories and, and hearing them and sitting with people and reasoning? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely like, it can be challenged. It's definitely challenging, right? I will say that. Um, I think it's a different way of approaching scholarship, right, yeah. that sometimes feels a little bit more daunting because, you know, it's a whole process, right? You have, you prepare for interviews, they could go anyway, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people could answer a question like how you think that they would answer or not. Um, there are people who sometimes want to share their whole life story with you and you end up down there chat for three hours or whatever right yeah. um, versus like somebody who doesn't want to share with you in <laughs> only like 30 minutes right yeah. um and so I've definitely had to be like all right if I if there's a day where I you know I'm supposed to do an interview or something I just don't really like schedule to plan anything else for the day because yeah who knows what could happen right yeah. um and getting comfortable with the unknown in a sense right um and also trying to be very careful with people's experiences and things, right? I think acad the academy can be extractive. The yeah. academy um, can take and has definitely taken from people's lives and experiences and hasn't given back to that, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, being mindful that while somebody might say something in an interview because they're caught up in a moment or, you know, they have a good rapport with you, they might not necessarily want that to go out into the world yeah and so sort of like following up with your subjects um I transcribe my interviews and then send them yeah to people beforehand right um that's the whole process in itself having to transcribe yeah. if you are you know working with there are like a million um things out there that will transcribe <laughs> interviews right and if it's quote unquote I say that the quote the air quotes very um particularly because the <laughs> the hierarchies of language right but you know yeah. if it's somebody speaking in English standard English um and that's again quotes there it's fine right but you know naturally as Jamaicans we all go weave into this and say yo yeah. my, you know all of those yes. things and it's not catching that nope it's yeah. not it's and it, it has it completely fumbled it forces a word as well and oh right and I'm like yeah. what did 
no. So, you know, that is a whole next thing, right? So I'll let it, I'll let the transcription thing run first, just because hopefully it'll catch more than 50% or whatever, right? But then I always have to go back in and re-listen and fix whatever it does weirdly. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I think it's, it's definitely different, but I think in lieu of, you know, the archives or um, wanting to breathe life into stories that cannot always be captured by numbers, right? Or, yeah. um, you know, people like I chose to be the type of historian I am to really capture experiences and write stories of people's humanities, yeah. right? And people's experiences in a particular way. And I think oral histories are a beautiful part of that. Um, and one that also like lives on, right? I've always enjoyed um, my fam, like various elders in my family telling me stories and listening yeah. to how it's shaped our family trajectory and things to that nature. And it's very much the same thing, just like on a different scale or, you know. Yeah. So um, that's been my hope to really help not only the individuals tell their own stories, right? But also... Um, putting them out there so that you know future generations can view them as well. Definitely, it's it's so important as well. Um, and I think the the thing I found doing oral histories as well is actually asking someone to sit down and tell their story makes them feel that there's an importance in their story, which there's importance in all of our stories. But actually saying to someone, look, like I want to sit and record and take time to hear what you have to say about this particular thing or event or you know part of your life it really does I think a lot for for them as as people that I think when writing the histories of these people has it's often been overlooked to their actual stories um so yeah I I think that's one of my favorite parts about oral histories and the possibilities of it essentially in in using that as to kind of go alongside other kinds of research as well or or completely um you know using it as a as the core core of work Um, I also wanted to ask you um, about your PhD research in the sense of thinking um, about women um, and the kind of bit that you're doing or working on now. Um, How has, not how has it been thinking about women, but obviously you're coming at this from a perspective of being, you know, Caribbean descended woman and you're taking on these stories, which obviously probably holds more weight to you maybe than if you were researching something that didn't kind of link with your identity how has that been does it is it a pressure does it how does it feel to to do these tell these stories essentially yeah um I'm glad you're asking me this now and maybe like not a year ago or something um (laughs) yeah I definitely no no you're totally fine um I definitely went through the wave of like the imposter syndrome right um or Yeah, the feeling of being like, am I really like, I I definitely had a moment not long, like maybe a year or so ago. And I was like, you know, say I could have just, I could have just wrote anything easy, mm-hmm. like not easier in as if like there's such thing as an easy PhD to me. Yeah. Right. But easier <laughs> in the sense that like something that is not as close um to who I am. Right. Yeah. But um I also I think in that moment or while I was kind of getting through that moment was also like but you know if there was somebody you would want to see it do it it would want to be you would want it to be somebody who looks like you right Mm -hmm. um I think I've read quite a few books and about and it's not to say that you can't do research on um on people or a place that you're not from necessarily but you're always going to like miss out, right? You're, if you're not necessarily like from that background or even me, right? Like I was born in the US, so I'm not essentially perfect either, right? Um, So not tooting Mm -hmm. my own horn by any means, but somebody who, you know, might just be walking into a place to study might not get 
some of the cultural nuances or be able to understand the patois that is being used in Mm -hmm. a like uh, interview right to the same regard and or even one thing that I've been also working with through my interviews is wanting to write um you know parts of quotes or things in patois if that's how they're said because you know wanting to uplift the language that you know my interviewees have used and the importance of patwa for us right yeah. um as a as what people have called a nation language and so these are all i think different things that i've noticed about the process um that have made me at this juncture now be like yeah it's all right it's difficult you know um it's not yeah. easy but i think i'm definitely proud to do it i'm proud to sort of make a mark in that way um And I think it's also helped a lot of, you know, my interviewees um, Mm -hmm. too. when I remember somebody saying to me, we were talking about, you know, before the actual interview, we were talking about like where my family's from and, you know, just like, you know, meeting each other and getting to know Mm -hmm. each other and stuff before the actual interview. And she was like, it's so nice to have somebody ask me questions that like actually gets who we are right um and that was like a major moment for me to remember and think about and say okay it's difficult yeah but um not only will it get done but I think I'm I'm hoping to do it justice in a sense by um, upholding you know the stories of other Caribbean women like myself absolutely no it's so so important um it's really funny you mentioned that story that you had. There was, I think I was in the archives listening to an oral history project that had been done years ago and the interviewers were asking questions that were kind of, if you knew anything about the person they were interviewing, they were silly questions essentially. And at the end they asked, you know, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, and the person being interviewed said, well, you know, next time you do an interview like this, I think you need to do your research first. Um, because there's a lot of questions that you didn't even ask me that you actually should have asked me um, but you wouldn't know to ask because you just haven't done your research and I I was listening to it like oh I would hate to be that person in the room that's you know oh finish the interview and we're we're all set but um, they'd come into this um, quite well assuming they'd gone into it under research or quite naively um, and they just didn't know there were just some things that had, had gone over their head and they weren't aware of and it is true that you know doing the work being in that community or um resonating with it or having grown up around it it is is not necessarily easy as you said it's definitely not about ease but it is about having an understanding I think and having quite a nuanced understanding of of the culture of the complexities of it as well um even being and me being in the British context being born in Britain and of Jamaican descent um doing that work definitely um but I think yeah like you said it's a it's a rewarding process um and you will do it and you will do it well so don't worry about that for sure um you're nearly you're nearly towards the end you're uh, you're further along than me I don't want to push anybody into finishing a PhD because I'm not not my ministry but yeah you're further along than me (laughs) yeah the goal is to be done next year so I fingers crossed I'm in my penultimate year love that brilliant oh finish line since, since I, right I'm yes. like 2025 where we <laughs> oh I can imagine honestly don't ever me included ask a PhD student um when they're nearly done or when they're gonna finish people ask yeah. me all the time also oh, like, when's this done I'm like I, I just I feel like I started yesterday it, or people that they don't understand like what a dis- dissertation entails so yeah. I had a conversation with a family member that was like, oh, isn't it like 50 pages? I was like, no, time, times by like four. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm just oh, like, I'll people, you know. Yeah, when people say things in pages as well to me, I'm like, I don't even know how many pages it's going to be. It's going to be long. That's what it's right. going to be. It's going to be long. long. A proper a lot a to proper say. book size. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically a book. Um, It is. And I always, it's always funny when, people are so supportive of what you're doing but they don't really get it so it's kind of like a you're not done <laughs> it's not finished it's like no no, no. no. 
That is, yeah. I'll let you know when to come, when to dress up, <laughs> when to put on your nice frock and your nice shoes and fall. I will let you know. But Absolutely. until then, just just love yeah, me and let me do what mm-hmm. I need to do. Absolutely. <laughs> just make me food and pat my head. <laughs> That's all I need. Absolutely. Oh, man. Honestly, PhDs. Um, I wondered, you mentioned um, potentially putting your work into a documentary and like, you know, seeing it in other forms. Had you thought of any other ways or other things that might come out of the research you're doing, um, the PhD that is? Obviously, you have your podcast as another output as well, but I wondered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I think there are so many different avenues now with tech, yeah. um, with, you know, library archives and things. Um, obviously, the podcast, which I really again, also, you know, started in a sense to have these conversations and share different facets and aspects of Caribbean history with the masses. Um, So yeah, I haven't fully like nailed down what I will do, particularly with them. Um, But wanting them to, you know, be accessible is always my main takeaway. um, So that, you know, anybody regardless of you know, all of the barriers can definitely check them out. But in my mind, it's a documentary right now. But, you know, I will also cross that bridge after graduation because trying to write cool. and edit a documentary and, you know, and as, especially as a Jamaican, we don't do things, we don't do things, small fries and squan squan and all those things. So I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to have to, <laughs> to make a little whatever bootleg version yeah. of a documentary just to say I did one. I want to do it make it cute and edited well yeah. and all of the exactly. things so yeah yeah but, just, just uh, proper. yeah for sure but I think um if not a documentary maybe some sort of like digital humanities website or something like that where there they will all be available that way nice nice yeah definitely it would be good especially I think when you put so much work into things like oral history and that kind of thing it is good for it to live on if not in your work in somebody else's work that might utilize it um afterwards um you obviously have a podcast strictly facts which I love um what made you decide to start a podcast did the podcast come first or the PhD uh when did that all begin um and how is it I guess how do you how do you balance the two I'm asking for me (laughs) asking for me I started grad school first um and within my first semester of grad school had this podcast idea Mm. but also you know a very wise person told me to like especially my first year parse myself out a little bit you know I moved to a whole new state I had to like figure out where the grocery store was you know what I mean Mm -hmm. all of those small things that we sometimes don't think about and so while I had the idea during my first semester of grad school I was like um maybe I need to just get like acclimated right um and so I kind of put it on pause for a little bit but what I did not know was that a few months later we would be in a global pandemic Um, Mm. and so like a lot of us, you know, everybody was trying to figure out what to do and, um, how to occupy time at home and all of these things. Right. And so I, you know, the, uh, the idea spun the block and I was like, all right, I free up a little bit. So yeah. Um, Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and and culture officially launched January, 2021. Um, and has definitely been my, joy um I think a great way to have conversations and also learn new things right my specialty for the most part has been like you know from a PhD standpoint has been um on the Anglophone Caribbean um and I've been able to learn about the breadth of the region and its widespread diversity through Strictly Facts um and partner share with a lot of amazing people like yourself um to have on the show (laughs) but yeah it's inspired me to um again you know facilitate a lot of those conversations that I hope a lot more people just have access and awareness to um share and learn from one another um and just like big up the region right I think sometimes it's yeah we get painted as you know, sand and good food and music and thing, which is true, right? These are all 
true statements Strictly about facts. us. I love our food. <laughs> right. I love our food. I love our culture. I love yeah. um, our music. Right. But there are so many different and other parts of that. Right. And also so many people either from the region or of Caribbean descent, like ourselves who are doing work mm-hmm. around it. Right. Um, to yeah. empower us in various aspects and also wanting to shepherd and uphold that, right? We don't always have to look to others for understandings of ourselves. Mm. And so that is another thing that I've done. Um, but in terms of like keeping it organized and balancing it amongst grad school and everything, it has definitely not always been easy. Um, I recently um for at the top of 2024 like redid the website and the website we had before was terrible I hated it um but I just didn't I didn't have the time and you know all the things so definitely hasn't been easy um but I've I've tried to have a little bit grace with myself in doing that Mm -hmm. um but different systems whether it's like uh, you know, something like a Calendly, right, where, you know, we don't have to go back and forth and say, no, I, you know, can't do 2 p.m. or whatever. I'm just like, just go and go use the Calendly to, to schedule the interview or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of try to record um, around the clock almost just so that, yeah. like, I'm not stressed about you know, needing an episode. There was a moment last year where um, I put out an episode for Women's History Month that like was recorded in like January, right? And you wouldn't necessarily know, you know, unless I said it, right, which I am now. Um, But I think that's just been the way to do it because sometimes you have the time and sometimes you don't, right? And especially when you're doing things with podcasts and relying on other people's time, you know, I might have a free time in in March to record, but you might not. And so I'm just like, whenever, whenever we can do the thing and find the time together, but that's been my way to try at least. It doesn't always work that that way. Um, But I think, again, another labor of love and Um, and a joy and something that I think has also like made me a better speaker a better presenter right all of these skills that I think I also take into my career in academia and moving forward absolutely yeah it's a there are many many skills um to balance from the podcast in life I will say so um and thank you I yeah to be honest I think I went on your website um, when I was, um, yeah, sorting out this episode, and it's amazing. I love it. I was having a great time on there. I was on yeah. there for ages. I love it now. Hated it before. Hated I don't. I re- before. no. I didn't hate it before either. But I will. I will say well, it's, it's incredible now. Thank you. I, <laughs> I absolutely hated it, and I just was like, it upset me all the time. Um, yeah. But I think again, that's one of those things, right? It's mm-hmm. we have to get comfortable with our evolution right yeah if I would have just you know been like oh I hate the website it'll I, I'm gonna stop podcasting or you know what I mean um and then being able to like yeah. see my growth and evolution and have more followers and you know yeah. people who have reached out to me and been like oh. so like all of those things are motivation all of those things um have helped along the way and we just have to sort of go along and take the steps through our journey and I'm sure like there might be a time in five years where I say I currently hate the like the website right now that I love right which is fine yeah. um because that's yeah. part of growth you know what I mean um and I think that also applies to grad school that applies to a lot of the things we do uh, we just mm-hmm. kind of have to exercise grace with ourselves as we go through and um, know that yeah there can always be a better version or a updated logo or you know whatever may have you but we do have to continue that doesn't that shouldn't be the reason to stop right um, because yeah, our absolutely. platforms are needed you know our work is needed out there in the world indeed it is um, I wanted to ask as well um, in terms of maybe linking to your podcast to your PhD but obviously we have um, quite a large sizable let's say Caribbean um diaspora in Britain um and 
I know I actually don't know the numbers when it comes to the US. I don't know if it's kind of similar, but obviously there is a sizable African American population and and black people tend mm-hmm. to Caribbean black people slot into that and around that in some ways. Um but yeah, I wonder what is the uptake like on Caribbean history in the US? I know here it is it is the black history here. It's we don't obviously have like an equivalent of an African American population. So yeah, how 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 does it go down there? <laughs> It doesn't, um, if we're talking about school-wise. Now, it gets a little bit, like, better in places like a, Mm -hmm. you know, possibly like a New York, right, or like a Miami, depending on where you live. But um, for the most part, it doesn't doesn't really exist. I think my history book did name Marcus Garvey and say something about UNIA, um, and that was kind of it. Um, I think probably a little bit different from you all we see more of the like breadth of the region right um yeah in terms of you know the french caribbean or the spanish caribbean right um we get kind of like more of the widespread regional diaspora i went to Mm -hmm. um high school in miami right so giant cuban populations um and things to that nature So I don't have the numbers off the top of my head either, but I think while there are tremendous populations in different areas, that history doesn't always show up, which I have definitely found um, not only is like a detriment just in general, but also historically there have been several people who have migrated, whether that be from the Caribbean or, you know, even from the continent of Africa, who, whether it's they like migrated to the U.S. temporarily or you know for college whatever have participated in various movements in the U.S. right Mm -hmm. um we look at Shirley Chisholm who there's the new Mm -hmm. um Netflix documentary coming out about her soon right um born to um Bayesian parents lives in Barbados briefly right and goes on to make tremendous strides in Caribbean uh or U.S. politics, rather, right? And the list could really go on and on. Um, Thinking about all of the various activists who were influenced by Garveyism, Malcolm X's parents being one of them, right? Um, And so, so many ways that, you know, we see interchangeably that, like, the Black diaspora, regardless of sort of where on the map has worked together but it doesn't really take place in terms of uh, the textbook understandings of it it's one Mm -hmm. that kind of feels more like self-study or you know maybe more so in college if you you know go that route and get to learn a little bit deeper about certain understandings Mm, absolutely wow that's interesting um I don't know why I assumed your answer would be to that. Um, I can't, I don't think I'm shocked in hearing that it's, it's not taught in the way that um, it ought to be. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I guess America's a huge place, like very different to Britain. Um, so I guess regionally, as you said, there might be more uptake in, in certain areas than others. And I guess it's the same in the UK as well with, with cities like London or Birmingham, Manchester. Um, that are bigger and have um, sizable Caribbean people, communities and, and groups of people, it'll be different. Um, my kind of final question to you is actually um, just a kind of way of wrapping up, but I wondered, um, studying the Caribbean and the kind of regions that you do, is there anywhere that you haven't been or you've been and would like to go back to within the Caribbean? Um, not necessarily for the history or anything like that, just just because. Oh, this is a good one. I just came back from Trinidad <laughs> oh, <laughs> for Carnival. Okay. Oh, um, yeah, one I went day. for Carnival, <laughs> which was a great experience, right? Yeah. Um, I had a ball, but I also, you know, recognize that experiencing a place for Carnival is a different, you know, experience yep. of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to travel throughout the Caribbean and just, you know, experience our different islands and different cultures in that way, because there are so many nuances amongst us, right? While we are very much so one Caribbean, we're not all the same throughout, right? Um, And so I'd love to go back to Trinidad um, to experience. I'd also, I mean, in terms of like places that I've never been, 
Um, Grenada is on the list. Cuba is on also yes. on my list. Just yeah. to, I think, experience the histories of both places and, you know, yeah. definitely others that are, you know, different from what is told, right? I think for mm-hmm. Cuba in particular, there is a particular telling of Cuba, especially in the U.S. context, right? Um based off their historical beef and all of that, right? And I'm like, I'm as I've noted with everywhere else, it's not how the story is always written. Um, so I'd love to experience those places. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Cuba, I think, again, I also learned Cuba through study in America and the way that it is taught in kind of we got learned, we learned about it in the like context of the Cold War and it just it felt weird even learning it let alone then actually dissecting it and, and going going back to it in the future. But thank you so much, Alexandria, for joining me on the History Hotline this week. It has truly been a pleasure to have you. Um, if you haven't already checked out um, her podcast, Strictly Facts, all the information and your socials and everything will be in our show notes. But did you have anything you wanted to leave us with um, or share anything that you're working on or promote anything? I don't know. Yeah, of course. Um, for, you know, again... Uh, definitely check out Strictly Facts, A Guide to Caribbean History and Culture. I put out new episodes every other Wednesday. Um, and so we're across socials, pretty much all socials on Strictly at Strictly Facts Pod. Um, you can find me there as well. I'm the one that runs the socials. So if you want to get a hold of me, you can message me there. <laughs> um, but also, I guess, you know, other piece of advice if, you know, you're listening to this and considering grad school, um, considering the PhD route and it seems crazy and daunting and all of the challenges that, you know, I talked about and Deanna has definitely talked about throughout the show. It's true, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, but I think with proper support, with guidance, with mentorship, um, and with remembering your why, right? The days where I want to give up, I remember why I started this and what hope I have to make impacts on the future of education on the future of you know particularly black people right and how we feel about ourselves that is what I always come back to so don't be deterred um, by some of those challenges and go forward in your dreams that's it for another episode of the history hotline if you enjoyed it please rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you listen to or tell a friend to tell a friend To continue the conversation, follow us on social media at The History Hotline on Instagram and at The History HL on Twitter. The History Hotline is hosted by me, Deanna Lynn Cook. Research and marketing done by Zakia Riaz. Production by Waylon Mackenzie Witter and original music provided by Royal Sounds. Sponsored by Musetopia. Hotline.